No. No. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to this conference on new current trends in digital epigraphy, which takes place somewhere in the virtual space between Cologne and Sofia. My name is Claudia Soda. I am professor of Byzantine studies at the University of Cologne. I'm the head of the Department of Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies. And um, I have the honor to welcome you and to open this conference um, and this session. Um, the conference takes place in the context of an EPIDOC and FS online training week, which was organized and run by Martina uh, Filosa from Cologne and Dimitar Iliev from Sofia. And both events took place in the framework of a university partnership between Cologne and the University of Cologne and St. Clement Ochitsky University in Sofia, which is funded by the German Academic Exchange Service. I'm extremely thankful to both um, Martina and Dimitar for taking on the organization of both events. As I heard, the training week was a great success with 20 people from four continents, as I was taught, participating. And I still see people entering this meeting. Um, so at the moment, we have attracted 43 um, participants and the number is still growing. So um, it really seems to be a big um, success. I am happy that in the audience, we do have a number of people who have developed EPIDOC. Um, as we all know, one of the first major epigraphic projects um, to adapt the EPIDOC recommendations were the Aphrodisias inscriptions. And now I lost Charlotte on the screen, but she is in the audience. Um, and a special welcome to Charlotte Rushi, is who, as I always say, is the spiritus rector of many projects. Um, that are running in the field of Byzantine studies. Since the very first project, EPIDOC has been adapted to a number of um, fields in the humanities, um, like papyrology, numismatics, and sigillography. And I can proudly point to the fact that um, in an international cooperation between mainly um, Sorbonne University, CNS in Paris, um, King's College London, and the University of Cologne. We have developed a tool which is called CGDoc and which is based on EPIDOC, which allows for the digital publication of Byzantine seals. Martina, Filosa, and Alessio Soprakasa will talk about this um, later today. Other projects will be presented by our colleagues who have um, accepted our invitation. I'm extremely thankful um, for that. The presentations will span a period from classical antiquity to early modern times to the 17th century. Um, they cover a broad geographical area. And I'm yeah, very thankful to all speakers who accepted um, Martina's and Dimitar's invitation to share information on their ongoing projects. Um, welcome again to everybody. And I do now um, turn over to Dimitar and Martina. Um, I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion today. Um, as you all know, we will have a round table at the end of, of the workshop. And um, I'm sure that um, we will get very useful insights into actual trends um, in digital epigraphy. Um, so welcome everybody, welcome again. And please, Mitch, go, go ahead. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to uh, see here uh, so many people, and as Claudia said, uh, their uh, number is uh, constantly growing. Uh, so many people who have a common occupation and a common passion, I might say, in the studying, the research, and the encoding, the digital encoding of text-bearing objects, such as inscriptions, seals, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, 
Uh, this uh, could also grow towards uh, 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 coins and uh, bread stamps and uh, uh, different objects that could all use the same publication and digitization standards. And one of the things which I hope that uh, today, by the end of the day, we will achieve here is to uh, set some uh, common goals uh, before us as researchers scattered in different fields in different countries, uh, how this uh, very, I would say, very fruitful, as you will see from uh, the presentations today, uh, this uh, very fruitful branch of uh, um, combining uh, digital methods and uh, epigraphic and uh, sigillographic research could further develop. Uh, you will also see some uh, reports and presentations of uh, uh, findings uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, studies in uh, ancient and uh, uh, Byzantine uh, epigraphy, which I hope will be of uh, interest uh, to you all. And uh, let's let's hope that this uh, will be some sort of a uh, new beginning, as the training week, uh, which was uh, mentioned above, uh, uh, was still in progress. We already had some common topics and common questions, which will we uh, address uh, today. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, all the presentations that uh, we will see today will add further to these uh, uh, topics that uh, are of interest for uh, discussion. So uh, uh, thank you all for being here. And now I give the word to, to Martina, with whom we had the pleasure to uh, organize all this. Hi, also from me, thank you, Claudia, thank you, Mitko, for uh, your kind words. And of course, I would like to thank um, on my part to the speakers, colleagues and friends who agreed to participate in this conference. And if I may, I would like to highlight a particular feature of today's conference, which has been already mentioned both by um, Claudia and by Mitko. And there has been, as you might have noticed, for example, a tendency for work in digital epigraphy to focus on the inscribed text on stone of the Greek or Roman world. And in the framework of this conference, I hope, we try and bring together scholars involved in projects who are looking beyond those boundaries. And uh, as Claudia already said, uh, today we will hear speakers who will touch upon very different uh, period of times uh, going up to the 17th century. And also um, they will deal with a number of different text bearing objects and supports such as, for example, stone, lead and other materials, uh, plaster and walls among others. And I think that such a variety and such a multitude of projects will certainly, first of all, benefit the Epidoc community and challenge it in a way um, to change, to adapt, and also to find um, elegant and new ways to address and to encode um, new needs, if I may say. And we are um, actually humbled by uh, the overwhelming response to this uh, initiative. And we hope to foster um, a very productive and enjoyable conversation. And since we have here both major experts in the field and students who are just um, now approaching these kind of topics, and we are confident that they will benefit uh, from one another. And uh, as has already been highlighted, um, these uh, this conference and this roundtable were actually thought of. Um, as uh, a final activity for the students uh, taking part in the um, training week that has already been mentioned. And we wanted um, actually to, um, to make these students acquainted um, with uh, digital epigraphy in the field, if I may uh, say so. And I am super confident that uh, this new and newest uh, Epidoc project, some of them are actually beginning today. So, uh, Alles Gute and Kalodromo, and uh, this will definitely um, exceed our expectation. And uh, with that, uh, good luck, everybody, and thank you once again. And I would say we are perfectly on time. Let's stick <laughs> this way and let us uh, begin. So um, I'll, let me share just one second my screen so that we are all aware of the um, program, um, even though I harassed you with many emails, so you might already know uh, that. And we have 
um, we have a very dense program for today uh, with three uh, sessions. Um, the first one uh, chaired by uh, yours truly and second, third one chaired by Mitko. Uh, then we will have a um, pause and then uh, we will start uh, the um, round table, uh, which will be um, also moderated and chaired by um, our good friends Irene, uh, Irene Vajonakis from Bologna and Gabby Bodart from London. Um, yes, so I would say let's, uh, without further, uh, further ado, let's, um, let's start uh, with the very first speaker of um, this session, and it is our, our very good friend Charlotte Ruscha, and thank you so much for um, accepting our invitation, and I will, I mean, there's no actual need for an introduction, but I will still do that. <laughs> Um, and Charlotte Ruscha is Professor Emerita of Digital Hellenic Studies at King's College London. She works on texts from the Roman and Byzantine period, and in particular, um, is texts inscribed on stone. And since the early 2000s, she has published inscriptions from Turkey and more recently from Libya. And she has been working with the international team who are using, testing, and developing Epidoc XML markup. Um, last but not least, she's currently using Epidoc and FS to prepare an edition of inscription from Tripolitania. So please, uh, Charlotte, go ahead. The floor is yours. And um, yes, we're here. Right. Thank you very much. I think of myself as the grandmother. <laughs> that's, 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 trying to define where I fit in. Um, no, this is the exciting thing for Granny. Uh, good. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Ah, no, that's, it's what's the second step? That's what I have to do. Oh, well, that's right, because I just clicked on the thing and I didn't actually do share screen. Share yes, screen. That would, giving it the command is a good idea. <laughs> um, Wait, so we are now we might do a bit better. To see that. Uh, One and sec. how's this? Um, okay, now we see that. Yes, I find it very, whenever I, open a talk, I tend to put the place where I'm giving the talk. And I find it very difficult in this case to decide where I am, but I think I am where I, I think I'm physically here and not in Cologne, which I much regret. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about new things. Um, I think the point I would like to be making is that I've now been doing this under the guidance of people who really know things like Tom. Um, well, in fact, my life was launched by meeting Tom back in the early 2000s. Um, we're, we were trained, I was trained in, in a relatively static um, subject area. There were changes in scholarly approach and above all, there was new material, new information. But I think that I and my generation and even later generations are finding it hard to grasp that we're in the middle now of a process. Digital epigraphy has been de developing, it is developing. And you can be sure that what we are doing now and what we say is best will look completely outdated in 10 years time or 20 years time. I can tell you in that regard, it's very useful having children because they always point out to you how old fashioned you are. Um, and that will happen to all of you, however young you are. This is a process. This is a process that we're in at the moment. And everyone has an opportunity to help develop that process. Our scholarship, your scholarship, is going to advance the quality of what we do. And it's really important to do that because we are in, we let us accept, a minority area. The, the population of the world is not perhaps aware of the extraordinary importance of what we're doing. It's up to us to use these resources to produce higher quality scholarship, which is accessible to a wider audience. And if you think about it, the combination of those two things is quite difficult and requires quite a bit of thought. But we are very aware of being told that we're in a revolution. 
And our revolution is not so different uh, from other revolutions in the past. But this is the obvious one that we've always been uh, correctly uh, compared to the pr printing revolution. And if you look at what it, what's important to think about is what did it change? Right at the beginning, early books imitated manuscripts because that's where they come from and they remain still very expensive. The huge change was that printing permits multiple copies. Copy, just reduplication is incredibly important. Um, consider that in repress in the, in the Soviet Union, when they were still trying to control um, information, you had to have a license to have a photocopier because multiple copies are a huge challenge. And that's when they're still in analog form. Gradually, they became cheaper, they became more accessible. And what happened? An array, array of attempts to control. And it's important to remember in the current discussions of copyright that copyright, the licensing of printers to copyright things, was as much a system of control of thought as it was to give rights to the producer. And then nowadays we're always told about how important it is to have copyright because it'll help a producer. Actually, um, if you look at the development of copyright, a lot of it is encouraged by governments because they want to keep an eye on what's happening. And I think I like this. It's interesting to think that Elsevier were one of the great uh, publishers who opened up the world to so many people. Um, if you look at the prices of Elsevier nowadays, you will wonder about that. So interesting to think, to watch what can happen as a process. So this was the first computer that we got in the department. Um, and uh, I went and sat down in front of it one day in, I think it was 85, 86. And I sat down in front of it for half an hour. And then I went home because the instruction books didn't tell me how to turn it on, which is uh, a useful thing about, and in those days, we didn't know you turned everything on at the back. Um, and it's a very useful thing about instructions. But anyway, uh, what were the things that changed? The very first thing that people observed with computers was that was volume, that quantity of stuff. And the other thing that people noticed was the you could search in those quantities of stuff. And that was the principal focus of most of the projects that started, um, that, that got going using digital resources. And these are, I, I don't know how many of you will remember these, but they are touching memories for people who now don't have, who don't have a CD slot on their computer that many of the resources which we use were not developed, were developed before internet accessibility. So they were developed to function in a contained environment. In some ways, a CD was a very big book. So we're still in the model of copying the format that's gone before. Um, but the, the huge change comes with publication, with making public. And again, tendency to imitate the predecessor. Um, and it's interesting to consider, to look at a page of the Gutenberg Bible. The reason people love Gutenberg Bibles is not actually because they were printed, it's because they've got all this lovely handmade decoration. Um, and they were very expensive. Um, Anyway, the, uh, that's the replication of what went before, represented for us at the moment by the PDF. Um, I work on stone inscriptions, and I like to use this slide simply because 
it's a reminder that you start with a thing, a bit of stone, a unique object. Uh, and the first thing you have to do is wash it. Um, and I started to publish online in the early 2000s. And what I was principally concerned to deal with was the amount of data that I had. And it was made up both of texts and of images of objects. And my, my requirements were very much limited. I didn't think very hard about more than that. Um, and luckily, I had um, Tom and Gabby to guide me and to make it work. And when we published uh, the inscriptions of Aphrodisias in 2004 and 2007, we focused on capacity, on capacity and on searching, but the searching was inside, uh, in, inside the, 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 the um, publication. And it wasn't because we didn't want to draw on other things, but it, there wasn't much else to connect to. What therefore changed is the idea of interaction and interconnection. And the model for this, which I very much like, is how printing enabled the comparison in the Greek, the Testament, the New Testament of the Greek with two Latin translations, the Vulgate and that by uh, Erasmus. That got Robert Etienne into a lot of trouble. But the interesting thing is that in order to make it possible, Etienne, who produced this edition, invented the concept of numbered verses for the biblical text. Because only the numbered, only that way could you link things together. And a new Etienne was Tom when he proposed Epidoc uh, markup. It was about understanding the significance of consistent identification of things. And I was extraordinarily fortunate that I was able to work with Tom and with Gabby so that I was forced to use consistent markup right from the beginning. And by 2008, there was the possibility of linking to Pleiades, which is what we did, uh, we experimented with in the inscriptions of Tripolitania. Um, and we could exchange information. Uh, for example, the inscriptions of Ro Roman Tripolitania uh, were transferred, handed over to copies of them, went to EDH. And that was relatively straightforward transformation. So now what is changing? Now, as you've been learning this week, publication is becoming easier because of FS. That's a huge step forward um, and uh, an inspired idea of Gabby's. There are other models also being used. The biggest change at the moment, I think, is thinking about data linking. Um, that once there's stuff out there, then you start thinking about how to relate to it. And Pleiades has been crucial because place is a very good way of linking things together. It's not the only way, but it's a very good first step. And so a lot of the uh, Pelagios data is focused on gazetteers of place, uh, but there are other kinds of gazetteers one of the most intangible and difficult is perhaps gazetteers of people, um, but also gazetteers of um, shared, shared things like typologies. Um, so the important thing to think about is that we are thinking about both high standards and reaching people whose knowledge may vary enormously. With linked open data, we can offer people a digital footnote, 
So people who want to go and look up who Augustus was can do so, and people who know don't have to bother. And I think that concept of offering every level of information is going to be increasingly important. Rather than having one resource for the school children and one resource for the academics, there are, I think, going to be resources from which the school children and the academics can pull what they want. Um, and the other thing is, um, as you, as my son said to me some time ago, if you're not online, you if you're not on the web, you don't exist. And all this pressure to that you get from your institutions is about making yourself can be met through open access. People will follow a reference to open access, whether or not they follow a reference to a closed access resource is very questionable because they may not be able to. So it's, it's in your interest to be publishing open access. What I think, the other thing that I'm, been thinking about most recently of the changes that are actually happening is changes about collaboration. Now I'm finding that, and, and I think the CIGIDOC find, team are finding, that it's possible to work together. It will remain a question as to whether people want to. And that is a, a much more, that, there's not te no technological solutions to that. I like this picture of the Holy Spirit, God's sending the Holy Spirit to tell St. John what to say. And St. John is then telling um, a bishop called Widrick what he's saying. The chain of knowledge, that's a medieval representation of linked open data. Um, the closing your, there's nothing more satisfying than seeing the first copy of your book lying in front of you. This physical object, which you can trade, which you can give to people. You can uh, put it on the shelf. It is very, very pleasing. I have discovered that one of the problems about publishing online is that you've got nothing to give anyone, no offer, no off prints, no things. But also that model reinforces a sense of owning things, which is a very difficult, I mean, a, there's another talk to be given about that, but you might want to think about what you mean when you say my data. What, what, in what sense are they mine? And with epigraphy, with all the objects we're talking about, they are all somewhere. So the seals belong, are held by a particular museum. The inscriptions are found in, they may be in a museum or they're found in a particular country. You may need to have permission to publish ancient material from that country. And so there's a whole nexus of ideas about ownership, it's mine, that we have to think about quite hard. Um, and we have to unpack what it is we're saying. There's a lot of discussion at the moment. People keep on talking about, oh, they've stolen my data. Well, if they've is your address your data? Is your name yours in what sense? There are a lot of difficult ideas there, which I think it will be useful for us to think about over time. Um, but you do want, you, you own the stuff, but you want people to know you're there and you want people to be, admire you. Um, an example of transparency that we tried to introduce with and people want to know where the stuff's come from. They want to know who the author is. And so here for um, the uh, 
for PBW, the Prospography of the Byzantine World, we've listed the documents which we've used, but we've also listed the people who have actually analyzed that particular document. Uh, the piece of information that you get has come to you from a text analyzed by a person. And that's just a, a, a rather trivial and manual attempt to be, um, to be, to, to be uh, transparent. Now, uh, this is the exciting bit. This is where I'm going to run every risk of getting it wrong. But we're inviting people. Let's see if I can give you, yes, I think I can. I hope that you can see the screen. We're at the moment building a collection of published inscriptions from Roman Tripolitania. And what you're looking at is the version of the publication made possible by, um, by FS. And it is, we've put it on a private server which isn't very expensive. And we are now sharing it with other scholars who know more than we do. Now I tell you, there's a lot of people who know more than I do about, um, about, the, uh, about um, the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania. I, you know, they're in Latin for a start, which is challenging. And I, rather than Greek, and I, it's, I'm not an expert. I want to get this stuff out here there in an orderly way, as richly illustrated as possible, as richly indexed as possible uh, with unique identifiers. And we have started to receive contributions. We started with about 900 uh, inscriptions and we've now got about uh, 1300. Um, and here we have the old photograph from the earlier edition very valuable because it shows how things were then. And then I have my colleagues in Italy have provided their photographs and their drawings. Uh, drawings are often particularly useful. Um, and uh, Francesca Bigi has done some lovely drawings. So what I'm hoping these two scholars, who are people I already know, have been extremely collaborative. I'm writing to other people. Uh, I just don't know. I just don't know how, um, how much response we're going to get. Um, I just don't know whether some of the people I'm written, have written to are going to answer, whether they're going to find the idea of sharing what they know, uh, something they welcome. And as I say, that's not about, that's not about technology, that's uh, about people. What I do say, I think humanists have a habit or are very good at critiquing stuff after it's been published, because that's been our traditional model of procedure. And therefore, I think that with online publications in future, we're going to think about how to pull in corrections or observations which are submitted after the initial moment of what we call publication. I think that's, uh, that's an, an, a next step, which I think we're going to have to want to think about it places challenges on the people who fund us, who tend to want to be told that a project has finished. And I think one of the big problems that we're going to have is that things don't finish in the same way. They don't, they don't just re reach a tidy end. And that's particularly true with inscriptions because as we all know, there will be more inscriptions next year than there are this. And people will say, why don't you have this one? Why don't you have that one? 
The other thing I just wanted to draw your attention to, I'm in the process of building um, the indices and wherever possible, I'm putting in a reference to Wiki Wikidata. Uh, I think other resources of this kind will develop. Obviously with place, there's not a problem because we have applied these, but um, I think that increasingly we're going to find ourselves. What I hope is that we can use exist and develop existing resources like Wikidata rather than having to develop our own private systems. Um, and all of this, uh, one of my biggest challenges is uh, I'm pro challenged by how to mark up uh, Christian, the Christian God. Should, how, how many, how many I've got, I'm, I'm not sure at the moment that what I've done is right um, in marking up Christian entities. Uh, so there's all sorts of things to discuss there, um, which, which I think will evolve over time, but it will only work if we talk to one another. And that's why workshops such as this are so valuable. Um, we need to work together on agreed terminology. We need to accept the kind of limitations that agreeing terminology produces, but the benefits of shared terminology outweigh the disadvantages. And groups like this, now that we can communicate so easily, groups like this can work together to refine those vocabularies. Um, and at the same time, we need to sh show at every point who's done what. So with the, um, with the inscriptions of Tripolitania, I'm including in translations by lots of different, any translations I can find by anyone. Some of them are two translations into English. I want to display them both because no translation is ever perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect translation. So we need protocols and technologies we need to, 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 to facilitate what we do and to raise the standard, but also to display who has done what, because they're not going to collaborate unless they can be sure that they can point, they can say to their head of department, this is what I did, this is what I contributed. And so I do think that what we're talking about is not, uh, 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 we're talking about very specialist area, very specialist subjects, which might seem completely irrelevant to the wider world. And yet the intellectual challenges that we're dealing with are not, are no different from the challenges that are being asked on a much, much larger scale. Um, and so, we as humanists, we're not just doing something irrelevant in a corner. We're about, we're thinking about how to build a ways of sharing and validating information, uh, which are, if information is the, is, the, is, the, is the petrol of the 21st century, then that is, as we've seen in the last 18 months, that's incredibly important thing to do. And I think where we're very lucky, where I've been very lucky, is the extraordinary generosity of spirit of most of the people involved in all of this. And again, I would go back particularly to Tom and to Gabby Boddard as the two people who've, who've shown me all the time that that this is the work of a community and that, you know, better together is quite a good slogan. It doesn't work for the British, who obviously don't think that better together is a good idea, but for the rest of us, I think we, we can 
stick with that. And I think this workshop is a perfect example of the kind of way that we can use modern technology, we can use lockdowns to build that kind of collaboration. So I'm really thrilled that it's happening. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for your enlightening talk. You know that I agree with like every word you just said. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes, we should definitely uh, within the year organize like a workshop of only Byzantinists only to, you know, pin down some, you know, some authority lists, some shared terminology, some shared vocabularies. And it's very important because it goes cross disciplines and cross, um, cross sub disciplines, I mean, and cross um, periods of time. But uh, that's enough of me speaking. We have like two, three minutes for questions. And I would say uh, if you have many, if you have more questions, we can migrate them to the, um, to the uh, round table later. I don't know uh, if you, Mikko, uh, agree. Yes, completely. But, but, but we still have uh, a couple of minutes for that. Yeah. So. And particularly by people who know that they probably won't make it to the exactly. end of the day. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a question from um, Stephen White and uh, it, uh, we'll read it. Uh, sounds like we should be capturing the attribution of which researchers contribution linked or embedded information to the body of knowledge. Does that capture uh, your idea? <laughs> yes, indeed. And I think, again, this is the edge at the edge of my expertise, but I think there are ways of, of doing oh. this. It we would need to pay attention to it. I suspect that the hard scientists have worked like this for some time. For humanists, collaboration is a relatively new idea. It's less new for those of us who worked in archaeology because there's inevitable collaboration there. But uh, for the, the, the sort of pure textual humanist, it hasn't been a very strong concept. And we've used the, the cover of the book to be the thing that protects our intellectual contribution. Um, Yes, I think that's absolutely right. I certainly use orchids as, as, as John suggests. <coughs> um, and I, I, everyone should use one of those. But I, I'm, what I don't know about, but you guys will know about, is if I have a page which, well, what I've tried to do on my pages is show uh, each, I'll just, I'll briefly show you uh, how I do a, how I do the, the translations. Um, this isn't a particularly good example, but um, I was there. I just, I've just put the, I've put the different translations there. So I've got two English translations and one Italian translation. And the the refer the detailed references are down here, so that's just a small thing that one can do. Uh, but I think one needs to keep on remembering to do that sort of thing. Thank you. And um, do we have any further question? You can either raise your hand or shout or just write it in the chat. Uh, Olga, please. We can hear you. Yes, Olga. sorry, can you hear me now? I hope you yes. can now. Yes. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Charlotte, thank you so much. It's always very inspiring to listen to you. Um, it's mostly, you know, a comment to start the day with a bit of a laugh. I was a bit, of, uh, you know, scared when you said that uh, um, if you are not on the web, you do not exist. <laughs> and I was thinking that uh, now we should change may maybe the expression of the card. Um, yes, terrarum network sum ergo sum <laughs> maybe, <laughs> you know. So is it is it really the, that bad? It seems so, eh? Well, it depends on your age. <laughs> 
It was my son who said this to me. Not okay. me. It's, we, we don't have that problem. My generation, that's not a problem at all. Mm-hmm. But, but for him, uh, if he doesn't find someone on the web, he just passes on. It's, okay. it's, it is about the next generation. So does this mean that we have to digitize uh, maybe all the bibliographic production of previous centuries and never go back to libraries or something? I went to a talk once uh, at a digital gathering and there was a young woman there who said, I can remember the last time I went into a library. It was in 1994. Uh-huh. She was a scientist, a biologist, but... I think that people go, if you, if you put your stuff out there, people will follow a link. Now, I know all of you are very good scholars. So whenever anybody, you, anybody has a footnote and you find a footnote referring to a book, you stand up, walk across the room, look for the book, or you go down, to, you get on the bus, go to the library and look at that book to check that particular footnote. Or possibly you don't. If you give a link, people will definitely follow it up. So your links need to be super reliable and correct, whereas you can get away with murder in a footnote. Which is, so another protection we're losing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, I don't want to be a, party uh, bummer, but we have to go on to the next uh, talk <laughs> and we will um, we will resume some of the questions, which I think uh, there are plenty of uh, during the um, round table. Um, so uh, our next speakers, which are two of them, and um, even though on the program, uh, there's just uh, Mitko, um, signed are uh, Dimitar Ilyev and Elina Boeva from the University of Sofia. And I will very briefly introduce um, them both. Um, Dimitar is an um, assistant professor at the Department of Classics um, at the University of Sofia. He has a PhD in Greek um, linguistics uh, and an MA in computational linguistics. And um, his scholarly um, interests are in the field of Greek poetry, Greek and Latin linguistics, late antiquity, and digital humanities. And um, the reason why he is here is that he is the um, principal investigator of Telemann, and he'll talk about that in a moment. Whereas Elena, she's finishing her PhD in the field uh, of uh, classics, and she's she is assistant um, researcher. Um, and the, the, the main technical expert, if I may say so, uh, in, um, at the University of Sofia from the Telemon uh, project. And uh, we are super happy to have you guys both here and please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Martina, for the introduction. I hope you see my screen. I have to warn you that yes. uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit ill, so bear with me if, I, mm, uh, if I'm not able to. <coughs> do without some coughing and sneezing and etc but uh so uh what i'm now going to present you uh is the result of a collaborative effort which has started some time ago i must say under the uh, instigation of uh, charlotte Truchet, who spoke previously and who probably inspired a lot of uh, uh, projects like this so we field of uh, ancient and medieval epigraphy. And uh, this is the Telamon collection of Greek inscriptions from the territory of today's uh, Bulgaria. And uh, I'm uh, uh, presenting this together with uh, Elena, who will give you some uh, technical uh, details about about it. But uh, as you will see, there are uh, a lot of people who are involved and have been involved through the years in this project. And I just want to share my three main points about this. Uh, how do we treat the monuments and why this is important? Uh, what is the collaboration between different people, uh, specialists in different fields? And our platform, which is uh, inspired by and based on FS that we're using, 
The latter one will be introduced by uh, Elena briefly without going into too much technical detail, but uh, we're open for any further questions. So, if I have to say that, do you, do you, do you see slides changing? Okay. I have to say that the task of uh, um, gathering together the inscriptions in Greek from the territory of uh, uh, today's country of Bulgaria is a very challenging task. Uh, here you see one uh, very famous uh, uh, example with which I'm uh, illustrating the collection, the so-called Dane Stele from fifth century BCE, but uh, overall there are more than 4,000 uh, inscriptions in Greek up to the end of uh, antiquity, wherever we put that uh, uh, chronological boundary uh, in uh, uh, Bulgaria. We're not talking here about uh, uh, Byzantine and post-Byzantine monuments. Uh, and uh, if we deal with this, the number will grow exponentially. Uh, the Greek inscriptions from classical and late antiquity uh, are uh, dating from a span, chronological span of sixth century BCE, to 6th century CE, so you see uh, uh, a great chronological span. And there are already two main printed corpora upon which we are uh, basing our edition, but uh, as you will see, there's uh, more to it than that. Uh, there is the five volume uh, corpus uh, published uh, by uh, Georgi Mikhailov uh, in uh, the span of several uh, uh, decades, which is the Greek inscriptions found in Bulgaria, Inscriptiones Grets in Bulgaria, Reperte, with a uh, volume, with an additional volume, which is uh, with the addenda at Corrigenda. There is also a volume uh, about uh, Spät Griechische und Spät Lateinische Inschriften aus Bulgarien, uh, published uh, in uh, Vienna in 1964 by uh, Veselin Beshevliev, uh, which covers more or less the period of uh, late antiquity from the 4th to 6th century uh, CE. But apart from that, there are a lot of separate publications here and there in the archaeological periodicals, uh, which are sometimes, uh, I have to say, very uh, hard to reach and very hard to uh, acquire. And there are, in addition to that, other smaller uh, more uh, <clears throat> specific uh, collections, uh, such as, for example, the uh, inscriptions from the uh, ancient town of Kabylia in Thrace are uh, published in a, a special uh, collection, and there are other things like that. Uh, here you see the um, main territorial distribution in this uh, Opus Magnum, which is the uh, corpus published by uh, uh, Mikhailov and its uh, different uh, uh, volumes as they could be projected onto the uh, territory of uh, today's uh, Bulgaria. From the uh, earliest Greek colonies on the western part of the Black Sea coast, uh, up to some uh, inscriptions from uh, Roman times from the provinces of uh, the Roman provinces of uh, Thrace, and uh, the Roman provinces of uh, uh, Mesia Inferior, which uh, also has, uh, in the northern part of Bulgaria, which uh, uh, also has some uh, Greek-speaking enclaves uh, into it, uh, uh, together with uh, parts from the uh, Roman province of uh, Macedonia in today's uh, southwestern uh, Bulgaria. Uh, our main ambition is to collect different monuments scattered into different places, published into different languages and uh, uh, containing different uh, information, uh, to gather them all in one place, to give them a revision in the light of uh, the latest uh, uh, epigraphical and archaeological discoveries, to provide them with a modern translation of the texts as well as of the metadata in at least two languages, English and uh, Bulgarian, uh, and to verify as many monuments as possible by autopsy, uh, which our uh, principal epigraphical expert uh, 
Nikolai Sharankov, whom you will also um, be able to hear today, uh, has done and uh, is uh, currently doing, and also to provide them with a new commentary, which sheds additional light uh, on their provenance, their content, the people and the places and the institutions and the special notions mentioned in them, uh, as much as possible in line with the state of the art in both uh, uh, ancient history and uh, current uh, epigraphy and current archaeology of uh, Bulgaria and the region. Several examples, which uh, I will uh, then show you uh, also on our um, in, on the demo of uh, our uh, new telemall site, which, uh, by the way, sees the light of the day before uh, a broader audience uh, uh, today for the first time. Uh, there, there are uh, significant revisions in some cases concerning the prosopography of some people and uh, not only local people, but also uh, Roman officials uh, and uh, Roman uh, provincial uh, officials, uh, which uh, then had their uh, cursus honorum all over uh, other places in the uh, empire, uh, which are in the uh, light of uh, the new autopsies provided by uh, the, um, the team and in the light of some uh, the revision of some uh, old readings and uh, uh, the revision of some uh, uh, newer proposed uh, hypothesis about uh, uh, this. For example, we have uh, uh, Roman officials such as the provincial uh, governor, uh, which in the edition of uh, uh, Mikhailov, which dates from uh, 1961, of uh, one particular uh, monument, which is a uh, milestone dedicated to uh, uh, an emperor, uh, an emperor Gordianus, uh, from the territory of uh, Philippopolis, or today's Plovdiv, uh, we have, according to the old reading, which is uh, still used by uh, uh, the majority of uh, the scholars who uh, deal with uh, this monument uh, um, in, their, uh, in their studies, as uh, Quintus Atius Keller, or Pointu Atio Kelleros, uh, as uh, it is uh, present in the uh, inscription. However, the revision of some, uh, some uh, older uh, readings uh, combined with an autopsy uh, uh, from uh, uh, Nikolai Sharankov has uh, provided a new kind of uh, reading which changes the prosopography of uh, our corpus and not only of uh, our corpus, uh, it uh, uh, calls for a correction of the uh, prosopography of uh, the uh, Roman officials all over the uh, empire, uh, as you see here in the commentary, which is on the site, and as far as I know, it is uh, published uh, digitally for uh, the first time. Uh, this is uh, uh, not based on uh, previous uh, paper publications. Uh, the name uh, should be given not as uh, Catius Keller, uh, but uh, as uh, in some, uh, with comparison in some other inscriptions, uh, you see that uh, it is actually a uh, uh, Quintus uh, Atius Zeller uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> well, Quintus Atius is uh, uh, Mihailov's uh, uh, reading, but uh, actually uh, the um, the autopsy of the monument uh, corrects this reading, and uh, we see that we are dealing here with uh, a person named uh, otherwise, namely Lutius Catius Keller, and this is just one among the examples, and they will. Uh, grow uh, gradually as we add uh, new inscriptions to the database and uh, new names to the indices, uh, which are uh, the core indices of uh, Ephesus, as some of you uh, have uh, already uh, seen and uh, uh, known. There are uh, other uh, inscriptions and uh, other commentaries, some monuments which According to uh, more recent studies, uh, for example, uh, addenda et corrigenda to the um, corpus of Mikhailov by uh, uh, Nikolai Sharanko, published in 2016, there are inscriptions which were previously dealt separately and now uh, need to be treated as a part of uh, uh, the same monument, and we have included them in the collection 
uh, as such. Uh, you will also see that uh, we have uh, rich comments uh, concerning the uh, prosopography of the persons, uh, which are mentioned in the inscription, which uh, not only link these persons uh, mentioned in one inscription with other inscriptions from the same corpus, but also uh, we uh, have uh, the ambition to link to as many possible uh, monuments uh, which are uh, attested in other uh, collections, including uh, digital collections such as uh, EDH, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as possible. Mm, and we, uh, of course, give the uh, given uh, updated uh, bibliography. Uh, so this is, these are one just of the two instances uh, of our, mm, I have to say, novel treatment of uh, monuments, which some of which were uh, known uh, for a long time to uh, the scholars of uh, uh, the Roman Empire and of the Eastern Roman provinces. Another important thing is the collaboration between uh, people who are specialists in uh, different fields. The project was uh, started uh, some time ago by a research team from the Department of uh, Classics, including uh, Professor Mirena Slavova, Nikolai Sharankov, and yours truly. I have to say that uh, uh, all of them are uh, uh, present here in uh, today's uh, conference, and uh, you will hear what uh, Nikolai has to say uh, in a while. Uh, we have uh, uh, Elena Boeva as our main technical coordinator, which is some of a uh, some kind of a, mm, internal uh, in, in between link uh, between the uh, uh, our web developer, who is uh, Ivan uh, Amzov, and uh, our uh, mm, research team of specialists, and also our collaborators, which I have to say that uh, they are mainly drawn among our BA and MA students from the Department of Classics. Uh, a lot of which have been studying uh, epigraphy and also digital epigraphy as optional courses in the uh, BA and since recently in the uh, MA program of, uh, uh, of the Department of Classics. And, in our new established MA program in digital humanities at uh, the university. So what we are trying to establish is uh, also a sort of uh, um, <clears throat> self-maintaining uh, perpetuum mobile where the, uh, our current research concerning the encoding of the inscriptions for the Telemon collection enters the course of uh, uh, education and we train uh, students how to encode inscriptions based on uh, what we uh, what we do in the Telemon collections. And then some of them stay with us as collaborators in the project. And I have to say that uh, uh, Elena, which is uh, uh, one now of the key figures in the project, uh, is uh, uh, also among them. And uh, we, we are now in the final stages of uh, accomplishing our new platform in the framework of uh, the uh, National Research Infrastructure, CLADA BG, which is uh, also a consortium of uh, specialists in uh, uh, different fields spanning from prehistory until early modern times. Uh, and uh, our collection will be a part of this uh, large treasury of uh, knowledge and heritage from today's, uh, the lens of uh, today's Bulgaria. And now our platform, which is based on uh, FS and uh, which uh, uses most of the functionalities and the features of FS, uh, but uh, is also uh, built somehow differently for the purposes of uh, uh, our project. But uh, this is the, uh, you know, the, uh, purpose of uh, open source and uh, sharing that uh, everybody is invited to uh, build upon what uh, already exists and we will be inviting people to build upon what we have done with our, I shall say, probably uh, distribution of FS. We uh, chose to call it uh, Ajax because, uh, you know, in uh, uh, Greek mythology, Ajax is the son of Telamon. So, uh, you can uh, uh, think of it in uh, that terms. We still have to come up with some uh, 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 smart abbreviature uh, beside this, but uh, 
this is the main idea. So you have all the functionalities of FS in indexing, displaying, transformational scenarios, etc., of the Epidoc XML files. But upon this, we have put a database, uh, a table uh, database, uh, which uh, processes the XML elements, attributes, and values and their content using a uh, simple, uh, simple uh, PHP, such as uh, one which could be uh, treated uh, successfully by uh, any uh, web developer who is uh, um, who is competent in uh, building uh, sites, uh, including uh, commercial sites and uh, things like that. So uh, it's in a way not as flexible as uh, the uh, original FS, since you're not supposed to do everything uh, by yourself as a uh, humanist scholar, you do it with the uh, help of uh, a web developer, but uh, uh, together you can uh, accomplish uh, uh, other uh, things uh, which uh, could uh, be developed uh, further than uh, uh, the uh, existing uh, features. And a customizable code with core functionalities will be very soon shared as uh, open source probably. Uh, via uh, GitHub uh, or uh, uh, something. And I will give you the web address of our uh, platform, but uh, here is a, a little walk through this. You see the uh, familiar, but with a bit of uh, uh, changed uh, design uh, interface of uh, uh, FS. Uh, you see a description of the monument. Sometimes uh, we have uh, uh, all the information and uh, uh, images needed. Now we're currently uh, trying to establish collaboration with uh, uh, as many museums as uh, possible in order to, uh, in order for them to also take part in the enriching of the content of uh, uh, of our collection. And uh, uh, of course, uh, their input uh, is uh, uh, kindly attested in the. Uh, <clears throat> in the inscription itself. Uh, you see, we, we have uh, also a uh, uh, map with the coordinates as, uh, um, as exact as possible uh, for the whereabouts of the uh, separate inscriptions. Uh, we have a list of all the separate elements, or at least the main elements used in the encoding of the inscriptions. And uh, then you have the uh, XML code. In the map, you have references to Pleiades, to geonames, to the uh, authority list that uh, we have, and uh, uh, etc. And uh, now I will give the word to Elena, who will briefly dwell upon the uh, uh, way this uh, all uh, uh, works. So, pardon me. Thank you. So, I will share my screen and I will quickly walk you through our website and show you some interesting features that uh, we use uh, in our <laughs> work. Probably. Um, the most useful thing, uh, at least I think, is that uh, we can really easily correct our inscriptions online. If you, of course, if you have um, user access, there are different levels of accesses, so different people can do different stuff on the site. Right now, I'm show, showing you the full access, but uh, for instance, if we want to correct this <clears throat> new uh, inscription, we just have this edit button and right on the spot, you can uh, do some minor changes. Of course, you have to be very careful because uh, it's not like using oxygen, it doesn't autofill, um, autocomplete the text and so on, but once you get used to it, it's quite easy. So let me show you the administration site. Here you can easily change both the content of the site itself and 
in the XML section, much like FS, you upload your files or a whole folder. You just index them and then you are uh, ready to use and to correct the inscription. So when you index, basically what happens is, let me, nope, okay, I, 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 I pardon me. Uh, so when you index all the information from each XML uh, file is um, listed and uh, reads, the, the program reads the XML file, it uh, extracts the information into uh, different tables uh, with different types of information. Uh, and um, from uh, the images folder, it uh, extracts, of course, the images, links them to the uh, file in question, and prepares a thumbnail for every um, for every image. So you have basically two images: a thumbnail and uh, one you can uh, zoom in. And then the search works uh, both for the description, for, for the apparatus of the text. Uh, so you can search with uh, words in Bulgarian or with text in Greek, and it um, analyzes uh, the search, then calls uh, the data database and extracts the possible results uh, and lists them. Um, and oh, and before then, <laughs> before that, it applies the filters. So basically, um, that is uh, probably not that interesting because it's too technical. Uh, but it's really easy to work online, as we all had to work uh, the previous year. So um, it is really useful that uh, this platform, this IX platform, allows. Uh, some flexibility in uh, doing changes as we um, work. So I don't know, Mitko, if you want me to say something more, to show something more. Um, I think that we can leave some time for questions if there's any, and uh, then probably discuss it in the uh, round table. And So yeah, thank you. I'll uh, show the let's let's show the uh, the actual link, <laughs> which is still a link of the demo version of the site. It uh, will be uh, also mirrored and hosted uh, at the uh, domain of the University of Sofia at uh, uh, Unisofia BG. But for now, you can uh, uh, double with it uh, on this address and. Uh, see what the features are and how it works. Basically, it's the uh, familiar um, um, FS uh, output with some uh, additional features and the possibility to collaborate uh, online as uh, our team has done for the uh, uh, past several months, putting the uh, finishing touches to uh, what you will see um, on the site. And yeah, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mitko and Elina. It's uh, always great to hear about progress in Telamon. And um, do you guys want to put the link in the chat so that everyone can uh, click on it? So uh, do we have any question? As per usual, either raise your hand or shout or write in the chat. There is. Yes, please, Stephen. Yes, I just have a quick question as to part of uh, displaying or can, uh, managing your revision. Uh, first, actually, the related questions, but how do you uh, select uh, which revision to actually put into the system? Because there could be multiple opposing revisions. And do you also support cubing 
uh, the idea of actually uh, showing a progression of the revisions uh, dated uh, uh, through the history of, of the research itself. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, currently, to start with the, the second one, uh, we do not uh, support, we do not uh, display this, but this is a very good uh, idea to also be able to put it on display how, how it is revised. And uh, I have to say that uh, we uh, revise the uh, available publications in literature and uh, etc. in collaboration uh, with uh, uh, our uh, specialist uh, epigraphers, Nikolai Sharankov and uh, Mirena Slavova, especially uh, Nikolai, who has seen most of the inscriptions that we're now including by uh, autopsy, and we revised the publications. And uh, it's actually a new uh, new edition of these monuments. Uh, we, we, we decide uh, uh, what, uh, what to include in the bibliography, in the commentary, and uh, which will be the final uh, version of the monument and the metadata that we uh, choose to include. It's usually uh, combination of uh, uh, all the previous publications that we are aware of, uh, those who we think are uh, relevant, and those who uh, we choose to uh, enter in the uh, main uh, <clears throat> text and uh, commentary and apparatus uh, sections, usually by uh, checking it out uh, uh, ourselves. I would... Uh... I uh, show or point to another, uh, let's say, dictionary yeah. online or corporate online for Gandhari, um, which actually does similar stuff where they um, uh, show a revision that's curated by them or with uh, current research, but they also publish they also publish the other uh, prominent publications somewhat in in an order of edition. Um, you can look at it at gandara.org. Um, uh, we, okay. we would be interested to, 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 to check this out, so uh, please send it our way. Well, uh, not all of the publications that we consult uh, are actually accessible online, and this is a, a, a great problem. We would... Ganhari, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, we would uh, very much like to um, uh, link to all the publications that are widely available so the reader could actually uh, compare. But uh, alas, uh, most of them are in uh, some uh, very obscure editions, uh, which uh, we tried to uh, find through the libraries. And none of them is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, available. Uh, uh, online, uh, uh, except probably for the <clears throat> publications of uh, uh, Nikolai himself, whom you can, who, which you can find uh, all, uh, almost all online. But uh, uh, alas, there is a large amount of literature which is not accessible, and some of it subject to copyright. So um, we cannot display everything as is. We we would like to. My my dream would be to make a digital library of uh, all the possible publications on the subject, but uh, for now it's not it's not very possible. But whatever we can, we point to it, and we uh, whenever it's possible, we display it. I'll I'll be sure to check this one out. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, do we have any other question? Because um, otherwise we can go on to the new, uh, to our um, next speaker and we can definitely uh, discuss more about Telemon uh, during the um, round table. Yeah, by the Which way, I... thank you. Thank you for the nice words in the chat. And um, cool, mm -hmm. so let's uh, go, let's go on um, and introduce uh, our next speaker, um, Ilenia. Gradante from um, Oxford. She's a postdoctoral research associate at the Crossroads project. And her research um, concerns mainly late Roman and Christian epigraphy, as well as Christian archaeology. Um, she recently completed the work on the edition of the first corpus of uh, the Signacula, um, which are Ro uh, Roman bronze seals, um, Signacula of Sicily, and it will be published uh, in early 2022 um, by uh, the Coita. Uh, and she 
um, her main task as postdoctoral researcher on uh, Crossreads is to uh, work on the digital edition of Greek and Latin inscription from late antique and early Christian um, era in Sicily. And we so much look forward to hearing more about your signacula. <laughs> Please. Thank you, Martina. I would like to say so good morning, uh, everyone. I would like to say thank you to the organizer of this conference for inviting me to present this project today and to participate in the, in the round table. So let me share my, my screen. Okay. Okay. Here we are. Okay, so the, uh, the digital <laughs> approach to this project is still uh, fully a work in, uh, in progress. That's why I finally decided to add round brackets to my, to my title. Uh, and I'm happy to share it with you. And I also hope to discuss it with you benefi benefiting from your suggestions. Uh, the digital edition of the Corpus of Signacula from uh, Sicily or rather in Sicily, as I will explain later, is in fact a recent development of my personal research, which began in uh, 2015 and uh, that in the, in the coming months will, will reach the goal of this first printed edition of this material in, uh, for Sicily. Uh, over the last 20 years, epigraphic scholars uh, have developed a new and growing interest in Roman bronze seals. Uh, the small objects are made up of a variable shaped lamina bearing an inscription, usually in relief letters and with a right to left orientation and a handle, normally uh, ring-shaped, uh, which in turn can house a bezel with figurative elements or letters. Uh, based on the textual contents, uh, we can say that most signacula bore the, the name of the owner, whether expressed uh, in an extended or abbreviated form, sometimes just the initials, and generally rendered in the uh, genitive case. But on occasion, it is possible to find the name of a delegate of the owner, a slave or a freedman, who used the signaculum on behalf uh, of the owner. Uh, the use of the genitive possessive case and the presence of delegates allow to attribute some legal value to the stamp produced by the seal. And so probably signacula were used in place of the signature to mark ownership or of what was, was stamped. We also know of certain number of signacula bearing uh, only auspicious formulae, both neutral and Christian, which can be considered messages of good fortune and protection addressed to the recipients of the stamped object or to the object itself. So used, uh, used to, to stamp documents and material of different nature, they came into use in the Roman culture around the second century BC, becoming very popular and widespread in the imperial age in many contexts of daily life. The most recent studies are therefore aimed to enhancing the, the great potential of these objects in providing information relating not only to the ancient economy and administrations of the rest, the property, both in the public uh, and private sphere, but also uh, in the identity and profile of the signacular owners. Well, our knowledge uh, of the Sicilian context uh, until the early 2000s was mostly limited to the editions of the main 19 epigraphic corpora, the, the CIL, the volume 10, parts two by Theodore Momsen and the uh, IG, the Inscriptionis Greca uh, for 14 for Sicilia et Italia. Um, Giacomo Manganaro is the author of a first catalog of the Timbri di Bronzo in Sicilia, Bronze Seals in Sicily, a uh, title that rightly uh, protects him from the complex and often unsolvable problems concerning the provenance of these objects, uh, the mobility of which is greatly increased by, both by their small size and by their function. 
Another essential basis for the study of the Signacola in Sicily is uh, Antonio Ferrua's volu uh, volume, uh, Sigilli su Calce nelle Catacombe, Seals on Mortar in the Catacombs, dedicated to the impressions left by Signacola on the mortar of the tomb covers in the Roman and Sicilian catacombs. The habit of sealing or decorating the mortar of the tombs using signacula is documented for Sicily in the late antique cemeteries of uh, Syracuse with significant comparison only in, in Rome. These impressions not only expand the, the repertoire of the epigraphic test, but enrich it with evidence that can be referred to the presence and use uh, in antiquity of these artifacts on the island. The circulation of Signacola in antiquity and in a specific territory is not necessarily linked to where the artifacts were originally produced, of course. And their uh, small size, the choice of a noble material uh, such as bronze designed for a long lasting use, uh, their function and their close relationship with the uh, owner make the mobility of uh, Signacula in ancient times almost equivalent uh, to that of their owner or even greater if we also consider the legal possibility of the inheritance of this object, uh, at least in certain circumstances uh, and social environments. Uh, consequently, the finds of impressions or signacula in archaeological contexts, uh, whether funerary, manufacturing or residential, offer valuable information both about the material culture of, uh, and the ethnic, social and linguistic environment of the owners living or operating in loco in a historical period. However, the signacula providing uh, this data are in general and no less in Sicily, a minority compared to the numerous uh, specimens recorded in the corpora or kept in public and, uh, and private collections. Therefore, it becomes important to pay close attention to the acquisition history and the history of the antiquarian collections in the region, including the main currents of the antiquarian market uh, within and beyond the island to recover further information on the provenance of this object. The main purpose of my work has been to provide for the island the first complete and systematic catalog of this class of artifacts in a critical edition supported as far as possible by autopsies of both artifacts and context and photographic documentation, thus providing a homogeneous documentary basis for future research. Well, compared to the 60 uh, specimens recorded by the main uh, syllogists and the, the 55 reported by Manganaro, partially corresponding to those already published in, uh, in CIL, amounting to a total of 97 signacula recorded up to 2006, the updated corpus is now composed of 109 signacula, including nine unpublished, and 12 impressions of mortar from the catacombs of Syracuse. <clears throat> the material, uh, dated on paleographic, prosopographic, and archaeological basis, covers a wide chronological span between the 2nd century BC and the 7th century AD. And the signacula of Sicilian collections offer a conspicuous repertoire of at least 15 different shapes uh, with some variations. Uh, I would like to point on the fact that focusing on the physical characteristics uh, of the artifacts uh, and creating typological classifications uh, does not respond only to a mere taxonomic need, but allow us to analyze, for instance, the poten potential relationship between the shape of the seal and the specific functional need perhaps uh, conditioned by the, the different nature of the res signata, the sealed object or the sealed document. 
More than these, uh, shapes can also express specific needs for self-representation of the owners or trends, which can be attributed to certain geographical areas, eras, or even workshops. And shapes, uh, shapes can communicate symbolic, apothropaic, or religious values, or be evocative of traders. Not to mention the possible interactions with the textual contents of the seals themselves. Well, in Sicily, the uh, rectangular, rectangular lamina uh, prevails in quantitative terms, uh, followed by the circular one. Uh, and excluding uh, the geometric shapes of the most recurring type is that of the solea, the sandal sole attested in different variants. Perfectly representative of the desire of customization, uh, which increased in the middle imperial age among the signacula owners, uh, is the eagle-shaped lamina chosen as an onomastic echo of the owner was cognomen, uh, readable on the seal is precisely Aquila. Rather original is the choice of the Kaikili, a family company who chose a lamina in shape of a cargo ship, perhaps uh, with three crew members potentially corresponding to the three persons mentioned in the text. In this case, the reference to the commercial activity of the owners connected to the transport of goods by sea uh, it seems clear, but we also know um, examples associated with Christian blessing formulas for which it is uh, legitimated to attribute to, to the boat a symbolic value related to the Christian idea of salvation. Anyway, the, relig the religious meaning uh, does not necessarily exclude uh, a commercial use of the seal, the symbol, as well as the auspicious or blessing formula assumes a, an apotropaic sense on these artifacts, invoking divine uh, protection for the stamped object, uh, its content in the case of uh, food containers, for instance, and certainly also for the people involved in various ways uh, in these commercial activities. The signaculum could be used by companies not only to make their uh, products recognizable or to seal documents, but also to combine promotional messages as the uni did claiming to have good wine. A sort of uh, communication that we also find uh, among the inscriptions painted on transport containers, uh, as in the example from Pompeii that we can see here, in which Umbricius Agathopus uh, promotes his liquamen optimus, uh, a delicious fish sauce. Well, the already mentioned neutral auspicious formulas so such as life, health, joy, happiness, good or long life to all, luck, or blessing formulas, which are Christian connotations such as pes in Deo, vincet Deo, Deus, and the Greek equivalent Christos Nika. Uh, were not used, uh, as we say, to mark property uh, ownership, but rather to extend onto it uh, divine protection or uh, a wish of health and happiness clearly addressed to the recipients. And we can suppose a, a purpose for the, the signacula of, uh, of this signacula uh, of stamping perishable and edible products, uh, such as bread offering uh, in convivial context, banquets, uh, weddings, or even Eucharistic rites, uh, according to a tradition that has remained virtually unchanged for uh, millennia, as we can see in this modern Greek example of prosper on the liturgical offering bread. In fact, we are still exploring the, the multiple uh, ways in which these artifacts we, uh, were used in the numerous aspects of the, the ancient daily life and the ongoing discoveries uh, of signacula and impressions in Sicilian archeological context appear very promising in this sense. 
to date, instead, uh, the, the progress made in the desirable digital conversion of a corpus of over 3,000 pieces, conservative estimated, still appears modest, and there are quite a, a few online resources available. A considerable number of signacola inscriptions have been included in the Klaus Slebe epigraphic database. However, in addition to the already known limitation of this database, namely the almost total absence of images and of any description of the support, uh, sometimes the identification of this class of artifacts seems uh, tricky due to inconsistent terminology or classification mistakes. So here you can see two examples of, of the Sicilian signacula that we talked about about and how they are classified. And so uh, in the second example here, uh, you can see that also the material uh, is wrong, for, uh, for instance. And this is suddenly, this is not an uh, isolated case. Um, about 400 signacula uh, from the Italian peninsula have been included in the EDR database, which certainly offers more consistent searching criteria, uh, allowing object to be easily uh, identified by selecting material, bronze, eyes, uh, and the object type. And in this database, in addition to the data on provenance and current uh, location, we can find the same essential information on the artifacts such as dimensions, material, writing technique, conservation status of the inscription, which can be partially integrated by images when available. However, the example proposed here perfectly shows some of the limitation of a, a rigid structure, which uh, does not allow an optimal solution for inscriptions placed on different parts of the object and with different uh, writing techniques. Here we have three inscriptions, the inscription indicating the, the name of the signaculum owner made in relief letters on the lamina, an inscription engraved on the bezel of the ring with the name of the delegate uh, slave, and a rare third inscription on the back of the lamina uh, made with engraved uh, dots with the signature of the craftsman who made the signaculum. So in the EDR structure, uh, the correspondence between text, writing technique, and part uh, of the inscribed object uh, can be clarified only in the, in the free text uh, in, the, in the apparatus. But this is just one of the many possible examples uh, uh, only to underline the complexity of the issues we all face in the digital edition of the instrumentum inscriptum, which uh, presents potentially endless uh, variables. So for this reason, Epidoc seemed to be the most suitable and flexible solution to meet the specific uh, edition needs of this class of materials, allowing to encode and mark up and therefore make searchable as much data as possible, both concerning the object and the inscriptions and decoration or symbols featured on it. Um, the, the digital edition of the uh, Sicilian Signacula uh, has been therefore welcomed within the uh, cross race project uh, directed by Professor Jonathan Prague and promoted by the University of Oxford and financed by the uh, European uh, Research Council. Um, and the, the aim of the, the, this project uh, is the unification and exploitation of all the epigraphic texts from the from the island from Sicily from uh, the 7th century BC to the 7th century AD in a single digital corpus and uh, uh, the, the other aim is to combine the, the findings uh, the data from the corpus itself with the 
analysis resulting from uh, three major sub projects that will explore the historical linguistic of the text, the social and economic and practical uh, materiality of the stone text, and the physical forms of the writing system employed. And of course, the interactions between the, all these uh, aspects. Um, building upon the exist, existing I Sicily corpus of stone inscriptions, Crossroads will bring all this inscribed object together for the first time in a comprehensive open source digital corpus using international standards such as Epidoc to encode text, images, and contextual data. The corpus of uh, Signacula represents uh, small in terms of numbers, but significant pilot project uh, within the, the, the Crossroads Instrumentum section. And uh, of course, starting from a homogeneous and updated documentation, good photographic documentation and data from autopsies, will allow us to provide quickly a proper digital edition of the material, expanding the possibilities of the printed one with the new metadata, particularly important when uh, archaeological contexts are preserved as for the impressions of Signacula or the Signacula themselves found in, in the excavations. Um, I would like to uh, show you uh, now to um examples uh, of the epidoc structures that we have uh, uh, designed uh, uh, together with Jonathan Prague and uh, Simona Stojanova uh, just to see together how we are facing the the several issue uh, concerning the, the, this kind of this kind of uh, material. And uh, I would like especially to focus on the, well, starting from the support description when, uh, where we can find, of course, a gen this is an, an example of a bronze signaculum, of course, and then we will see an example of an uh, impression on, on mortar. So starting from the support description. Elena, uh, Elena we yeah. don't see, we, we oh. are you showing um, uh, the XML template? Because we yeah. are still seeing the um, we are oh, still sorry. seeing uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, you have to uh, unshare and reshare the screen. And okay, sorry. Click on the top left corner mm, and yeah. say share all. Just a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you uh, just have to like unshare and then reshare yeah, I, I again. Can, but... I can find the on the bar. Uh, moment. Uh, I, I can do it. Oh, I, yeah, I can no. unshare yours. Okay. okay. Thank you. And then. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. And right here. Thank you. Yeah. There. Now it's. Can you see the? Yes. The, right. Okay. Good. Well, um, focusing on the support description. Mm. Um, we have a general description of the of the bronze seals uh, uh, and uh, of course using uh, um, the, the reference um, uh, to the uh, eagle vocabulary uh, both for the object type and for the material so signaculum and bronze and uh, uh, we can indicate the, um, the um, conservation uh, condition of the object. In this case, is a, a complete. Uh, later, I will show you maybe an image of this uh, of this signaculum. 
And uh, uh, after that, uh, probably the, the most useful way to uh, indicate the different uh, writing technique or condition of the different parts of the uh, of the object that we are talking about, we uh, split in two parts, two main parts, the, the object. The first one, uh, the MS part is the lamina, normally uh, uh, bearing the, in the main inscription and uh, um, encoding also the, the shapes of the of the lamina, so in the, in this case we have a rectangular shape. Uh, again, indicating the condition of the lamina that could be, of course, different from the condition of the of the of the ring, and the execution, the execution uh, technique that in this case we have relief letters for for the lamina, and the condition of the of the text, of course. Uh, on the second MS part of the handle, the part two, we have, of course, again, a description of the support as a ring handle with square external profile in a uh, free text. And then again, the, uh, the condition and uh, the um, description of the content on the bezel. In this case, uh, we don't have text about uh, decoration of palmet on the bezel uh, and uh, with a different uh, technique that is engraved uh, here in, uh, in, this, in this case. The, the same, of course, we have in the Uh, in the text part, uh, split in the lamina and uh, uh, within uh, lamina and uh, and handle, uh, with um, a reference list of symbols uh, that we can find uh, uh, on the lamina or on the on the on the handle. Uh, we. Uh, we uh, offer two uh, translations in English and in Italian for, for the text and uh, the bibliography linked with, with Zotero. Uh, concerning the uh, impressions, of course, we are talking about different kind of uh, uh, objects. Um, here, I like to show you an an, uh, an impression made on the plastered front of an arcosolium. So we are in the catacombs of Syracuse. This is an inscription in situ, uh, an impressive uh, signaculum on the plastered front of the arcosolium. So of course that uh, general description of the support uh, is this one plastered front of an arcosolium. The object type is the funerary monument tomb, and uh, the material. Of course, we are um, we are talking about the the surface uh, on which was impressed the the um, the signaculum. That's why we have a plaster in this in this case, and. Uh, um, concerning the, the layout, uh, we have four impressions of this same uh, circular um, uh, signaculum on the four corners of the uh, rectangular tabula. Uh, we will uh, link the, um, the other um, epidoc file uh, the, um, related to the uh, inscription uh, uh, etched uh, in uh, in fresco on the on the plaster covering the the arcosolium, and uh, of course we can provide the, the dimensions of the impression, uh, the execution technique, uh, impress it, and in this in this case, uh, some details on the um, on the layout and the hand notes, and. Of course, indications concerning the, the, the provenance may, uh, looking forward, of course, we, we will be able probably to point exactly the, the position of the 
uh, inscriptions in uh, in situ in the in um, the monument uh, that that would be very interesting to um, uh, analyze uh, also the context the epigraphic um, landscape of the different regions of the uh, of the monument of the cemetery uh, in in different times and probably also made by uh, different communities uh, now is too 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 long to talk about it but in this case we have an impression of a signaculum probably linked to the syrian community uh, that is uh, already attested in the in the cemetery of san giovanni in Syracuse and probably in a specific region of the of the cemetery and uh, well, finally, uh, here we have the the the, the text part uh, here um, divided into different epigraphic fields, the external one and the internal one, indicating also the text direction, uh, circular clockwise, and in, in this case for the for the. Um, uh, for the impressions, but it's probably um, better to show you. Now I will try to make again a new share with uh, again the PowerPoint. Okay, can you see the PowerPoint now? Yes. Okay, here we have the uh, signaculum that we were talking about. No, oh, sorry with the palmet um, uh, engraved uh, on the uh, on the handle and here you can see the um, impressions of uh, a circular signaculum in situ uh, above the arcosolium in the catacombs of uh, san giovanni as you can see we have the those four impressions and here a uh, detail of the text with the uh, epigraphic field uh, uh, divided into the uh, external one and the uh, internal one. Uh, well, I think that uh, is um, enough for this presentation, probably uh, in the future when we will be able also to show you how it will look uh, the addition of the signacula on the um, uh, uh, ICCLE database, we, we can talk about uh, another side project uh, uh, concerning uh, the 3D laser scanning uh, um, of signacula impressions, uh, trying to um, identify um, signacula uh, through the, their impression discovered in the different archaeological contexts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elena, very much for your uh, very interesting presentation. I have to tell that we are already 10 minutes late on our um, on our table, let's say on our schedule. Uh, so we have uh, times for a few questions and um, should you have more uh, of that we can always migrate to the to the round table but we have uh, a question uh, from Professor Grunwald. Um, uh, Elena can you read it or uh, do you see it or uh, or if you want I can read it for you so I can find is question. Um, so I will uh, read it for you. So uh, thank you for your talk. Um, do you have duplicates in your corpus? If so, how do you interpret them? How many of them bear Greek inscriptions? Do you provide artifact drawing as for yeah. example, in the Roman inscriptions of Britain? Oh, well, um, the, the, the corpus is composed mainly uh, by uh, Latin. In uh, inscriptions, so we, we have uh, uh, just few uh, Greek um, bronze stamps. Of, so we can probably say that in in Sicily, uh, so the, the the most of the um, the Sicilian Greek uh, bronze stamps are from the late antique era. 
Uh, and we can probably say that the the use of, of bronze stamps in in Sicily is uh, generally a uh, Roman habit, uh, and uh, that that's why we we, we can find uh, mostly the the, the Latin. Uh, uh, the Latin language. Um, concerned, excuse me. What was the the second, uh, the second question? Um, it's rather a technical thing about the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you have. Okay. Uh, now I can see. Thank you. You have double in your call. Uh, I have du duplicates in the corpus. Uh, very interesting. Uh, to uh, well. Uh, and uh, Sicilian um, um, signaculum um, discovered in uh, Palazzolo Crede, uh, close to Syracuse, uh, with a, uh, in, um, in an uh, um, excavation context. And then another one, a uh, copy of it uh, in different material, because in, in uh, Sicily we have a uh, in this case, a uh, uh, um, uh, lead specimen, and uh, in uh, in Spain uh, was recently discovered a second example of the same signaculum in bronze, exactly the same, same the dimensions, uh, is the same the, pale um, the um, uh, paleography. So we can we we can say that we have two uh, copies of the same. That is. Uh, uh, not so uh, rare, of course, uh, if we talk about uh, the use of signacula by companies that, of course, can um, uh, operate uh, all around the, the, uh, the Roman the Roman Empire. Uh, and maybe I mentioned level. I think that it's all of concerning this and question? if you provide drawings sometimes yes sometimes um of course we have very very good images of it probably in the future in the future we can provide also 3d models of it uh, but we we have also some some drawing Okay, um, do we have, uh, there's time for one last question and uh, otherwise I would say, um, let's go on to a um, coffee break, which uh, perhaps uh, should be uh, shorter. So let's say we reconvene in like 10 minutes and uh, with um, the talks by uh, our colleague, uh, Nikolai uh, Sharanko. And yeah. Setan Vasiliev and Nikolai Sharankov, and we resume it. Now it's, as far as I see, 12 o'clock Central mm -hmm. European time. Uh, let's meet up at 1.15, uh, quarter past. Okay. 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 So I will stop the streaming. <clears throat>